Well, I want to welcome you back. You, last year, last week, it was snowing, um, and you guys were hardy to get here. I see nobody likes to sit up front, and that's okay. <laughs> we'll take whatever we can get. You may have noticed some red balloons around, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, uh, let's see. And then before we begin this evening, I do have an introduction. I want to introduce Rolla Moore over here. She's going to be one of our speakers, and she is going to talk to us about receiving God's grace a little bit later. Okay, just really quick announcements. We, again, we have gluten-free desserts, so if you need a gluten-free one, just raise your hand. We'll swap it out for you. Um, and if you did not pick up a book uh, and a red folder in the back, if this is your first week, I should say, um, they are available back there, so don't forget to get them. And about these balloons, you guys, be real careful as far as um, you are so welcome to take them home, but our security system does not like balloons floating around here at night. So just be really careful when it comes to, <laughs> to take untying them. <laughs> but please take them home. <laughs> okay, is my uh, PowerPoint up there? Are we just having all kinds of little uh, gremlins in the house tonight? Okay, good, yes, here we go. I'm Leanne Dilley, I am the director of the women's ministry, if I haven't met you, and um, I welcome you here. I'm gonna be doing some of the teaching tonight. Um, the purpose of our event, I always like to show, is really to give women who are ready the tools to make an impact for Christ. And our inspiration for this whole event, all three nights, comes from Ephesians 1, 19, 20. Let's say this one together. I pray you understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. All right, and then we have an inspirational verse for each evening and for tonight. It comes from Acts Chapter 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So this is the beginning of our connection to the Holy Spirit and what we're going to do with it. All right. So here's what happened last week, just for your memories. And if, you're, if this is your first night to us, I'll recap this very quickly for you. We learned who the Holy Spirit is. And very simplified, it's a person of the Trinity who lives in us as a counselor, a comforter, a guide to the truth. Uh, the names of Jesus, God, and Holy Spirit can be used interchangeably. And uh, after we repent from sin, are baptized, and accept Jesus as our Savior, we gain Christ's powerful, resurrected life within us as the Holy Spirit. We decided we should expect infinitely more from the Holy Spirit than we might imagine to think or ask. We learned we should dare to ask. Repentance is like a daily shower. It cleans and refreshes us, and it's a critical piece uh, of keeping our communication open with the Father. We discussed the importance of prayer to develop an intimate relationship with the Father, and we learned how to listen for that still, small voice and the nudges of the Holy Spirit through Scripture and through the mundane, and then we had a chance to practice listening. And we concluded with the importance of ex waiting expectantly on the Holy Spirit. And that's where we left you. And waiting has been the connective piece between last week and what we're about to do tonight. Preparing ourselves to listen and the purpose for tonight, how to connect with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> So tonight we will discuss how to receive God's grace and peace and how to listen or recognize that small voice, um, voice of the Spirit, and how to connect or bring the voice to the outside world. We'll wrap up with an exercise on the fruit of the Spirit. All right. Um, our inspirational verse for this evening actually sets up Pentecost. And there's two main components in Pentecost. Number one, Jesus says, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit is so that we will know God intimately, because now he lives within us. 
The Lord will provide us with opportunities to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit so, so he can show us who he is and how he cares for us. Um, he, will oper- he will give us opportunities to mold us to what he wants us to be. And of course, it all works for what his will is in our lives. And once you begin to recognize the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life, I mean, the yearning for him just increases. And we discover how just addictive and contagious he is. Um, And it also will allow us to grow our confidence in him. Second part of this is, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Now that actually goes back to our purpose for being here, our goal for being here. The Holy Spirit will provide the power needed for us to be the disciples and carry forth Jesus' message to others. This command has not changed from the disciples' time to our own. We are still expected to carry Jesus' story of salvation to everyone. And we'll continue to talk about that a little bit more next week. But let's see what happens next with our disciples. <laughs> and here we go, Acts 2, 1, 4. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound like from heaven, like a roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like Flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Now, right now, I want you all to tug on that balloon because that's your t- yeah, that is your flame of fire. <laughs> so, there you go. That's the purpose for those balloons here tonight. <laughs> we want to be just like these disciples on the screen. <laughs> okay, and let's see. After that, everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. All right, now this is not going to be a lesson on spiritual gift of speaking in tongues or any of the other spiritual gifts right now. Um, We would need a whole class to cover that kind of thing. But I think it's important to note that speaking in tongues is a beautiful spiritual gift and is often used as a personal prayer language um, for those that are gifted with that. But I want to emphasize to you that it is possible to be filled with the Spirit and not speak in tongues. We celebrate this day of Pentecost because at this moment, this is the moment when the Holy Spirit was given to believers to live within us. Another purpose of receiving the power of the Holy Spirit is to accomplish God's will. And therefore, God will choose which spiritual gift to empower us with, depending upon what we are called to do. Again, at this first Pentecost, the the Jews had traveled to Jerusalem from many different nations. So it's important that we understand there was a required festival that time. And since the Jews were in different nations, they spoke different languages. And the power of the Holy Spirit gifted the disciples the ability to speak in different languages so people could hear the good news of Christ in their own tongue. After all, remember what the apostles were charged with. They would receive power to spread the news in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samira, and to the end of the earth. The gift of tongues is how the Holy Spirit empowered them to do it. All right, so today is about connecting. And all, we're going to connect all this information together and hopefully build your confidence in how and why the Holy Spirit might speak to you. I mean, this is kind of a big day, so <laughs> get ready. Um, last week, we read in Acts 16:7, 7, uh, Jesus told us that it's best if he goes away so the counselor could come. And now, do you see why Jesus was telling us this, why this is better now? Because Jesus in the flesh could only be in one place at one time. And, but now he can be much more widespread because of the Holy Spirit that lives in each one of us. So expanding the growth of what can be accomplished for God, for his glory. 
Do you remember the little food color demonstration last week where the color just kind of expo exploded when we touched it with the Holy Spirit? Yep, that's our concept. Okay. <laughs> now, if you're wondering at this point, have I ever been filled with the Holy Spirit? Um, you know, I think that's a good question to ask yourself. And another way to phrase it might be, am I hungry for him? Do I want more of him? And if you do, I think it's a good indication that you are at least ready to welcome the Holy Spirit into your life if you haven't already done so. So let's look at some other ways that the Holy Spirit might work in our life. And um, this is in a handout. This is a handout we have for you. Plus, it's in your Charles Stanley, Stanley book that we gave you, page 74 through 81. We gave you the handout, basically, and I'm bringing this to your attention, because the scriptural verses were not noted in the book. And we really wanted you to have them. Um, at least gives you something to begin with when you're looking at these references. This is not an exhausted list of what the Holy Spirit could do for us. We could not begin to <laughs> accomplish that here tonight, um, but this will get us started. The gifts, um, let's see, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. John 16 says, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and the coming judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me. So Jesus considers it a sin to not believe in him. Keeping ourselves right with God, which is another, really, another word for righteous, really, just keeping ourselves right with God, um, is, is a big deal. God makes us righteous under his authority because of our belief in him and because we have been forgiven. I added uh, one more verse to this uh, to kind of explain the conviction of the coming judgment, verse 11, in regard to judgment, because the prince of the world now stands condemned. I think that's important for us to know, to understand about the power of the Holy Spirit too. Jesus has already conquered the prince of the world. So with his authority, you know, we, we operate in that realm. And thank you for his work on the cross. <laughs> that's how we got there. He generates... He regenerates us. That's the next one. And we talked last week about Genesis 1-2, how the Holy Spirit hovered over the water in the beginning, preparing the earth for creation. Hovering is an action word, and it implies energy. And since the Holy Spirit is going to equip us to do his work, it's nice to know <laughs> there will be some energy to go with it. <laughs> now, he teaches us, and he guides us. Uh, number four. 3. John 14, 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. You know, I, I just love that he promises to remind us, because um, if your memory is like mine, you probably are going to need to hold him accountable on that more than once. <laughs> but he will bring to mind the things that he has taught us. Important to know. Holy Spirit comforts us. You know, John 16, 33, I had told you the... I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And I like in Matthew 11, 28, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. If I'm learning anything about the Holy Spirit, he wants to offer us peace. He doesn't want this to be hard for us. But we must seek him or come to him in order to receive it. Number five, he gives us spiritual gifts. So in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. In one person, the spirit gives the ability to give wise advice uh, to another, a message of special knowledge, great faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discern messages, speak in unknown language, and interpret what is being said. And that's not an exhaustive list, really, either. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the one and only Spirit who distributes these gifts. God alone decides which gift each person should have. Now, you may receive different gifts at different kind, times of your life, too. What just kind of depends on what is needed. 
Number six, the Holy Spirit imparts his nature on us. Uh, Philippians 2.13, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. As we become more like Jesus, we may be asked to give up a sin pattern or two. <laughs> and, you know, we can take comfort in that because he will give us the desire to do it and the strength to do it. And then God will fill that void with something from the Spirit. So number seven, he refines and transforms us that we become more like Jesus. Second Corinthians 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. I think it was, um, I think of Maya Angelou, I guess, <laughs> on this verse, where she said, you know, when we know better, we do better. <laughs> it's kind of like that. <laughs> Okay, and then this last one I kind of added myself because I think it was important and it, it wasn't in this location in Charles Stanley's book. Um, the Spirit assists us to pray in Romans 8, uh, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that, cannot, that words cannot express. Anybody comforted by that one? <laughs> yeah. I rely on that one a lot, especially in like conflicting situations where you really don't know what to pray for. Um, so allow the Holy Spirit to help you. That's kind of a biggie. <laughs> okay, and I want to bring your attention to one more book. I'm not going to go into this really because Chris Halsmer is going to talk about this tonight a little bit. But Mark Batterson has a book out there um, called Whisper. And... Um, you probably are aware of Mark Batterson and Dick Foth's uh, mentee-mentor relationship. Um, so, and, and Mark Batterson was the one that coined the phrase, uh, if your dream is, doesn't scare you, it's not big enough. You know? <laughs> yeah, I got, I got to love that. Um, anyway, I want to tell you about how I, how I found this book. Um, I was really getting serious about learning how God speaks to us and how to listen. And I spent way too much time at Barnes & Noble in the Christian section not finding what I needed. <laughs> and all of a sudden I decided I would pray about it. And I just said, Lord, why can't there just be a book here that's called Whisper or Still Small Voice or something? And I'd never even hardly got it out when I laid eyes on Whisper. And I thought I knew every book in that section by then. <laughs> so it's just further proof that the Spirit will give us what we need. And he promises to do so. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, this book really is fabulous. It talks about all these uh, ways he talks to us. Um, but I'm not even going to read it to you tonight because Chris is going to handle that. All right. Listening to the Holy Spirit is really about transformation. And we covered that last week. In the same way, connecting with the Holy Spirit is really about building confidence. Confidence in his guidance and his counsel and comfort and consistent faithfulness to whatever we need. Confidence in our ability to hear the Holy Spirit and then to act on what we hear. So ladies, just as transformation takes time, building confidence can also take time. So be patient with this. God is never in a hurry. And if you think about it, life changes are better process and absorbed when they move slowly. So try your best not to get ahead of God on this one. Um, the Holy Spirit is in charge of everything you experience, so trust him to do his job. Your job would be to pray and listen and wait and obey. Your obedience is also a very important step to building confidence, a connecting step. The more you obey and act on what you have been given to do, the more you will trust the process. You will see how God cares for you and how he tends to you and how perfectly his plans work. In return, you should experience some joy. Now, that's different than happiness, folks, you know, <laughs> but joy, um, which is, yeah, but equally addictive as happiness, I would say. <laughs> 
trusting the Holy Spirit is a difficult concept for us citizens of the United States. Uh, we have a trouble grasping it sometimes because we have so many resources that are available to us. Um, it would appear we'd have the ability to solve most of our own problems. You know, many other countries do not have the options that we have, um, and they really need to rely on the Holy Spirit much more for their day-to-day -day survival. Um, I want to tell you about what's happening in Iran. A mass number of people are being led out of Islam and turning to a relationship with Jesus Christ. They are calling this movement the Iranian Awakening, and there is a documentary called Sheep Among Wolves out there that highlights this rapidly growing discipleship movement. The Christian church in Iran has no property, no building, and no real central leadership either. And that's actually a good thing because it makes the church harder to locate um, and destroy by the Islamic Republic regime. And what's more, it's women that are primarily leading this movement under the veil. Women who could suffer severe consequences if found leading a group of Christian followers, Jesus followers. Um, they live as true disciples there, um, and they are willing to take these risks because they trust in what Paul says in First Corinthians. Uh, I'm sorry, Galatians. Oh, sorry, it was on the last screen, on the bottom there, in uh, Galatians 1:24. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body. For I am participating in the suffering of Christ that continues for his body, the church. So they have a confidence in the Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them every day. And they pray, not that the persecution necessarily stop, but that the persecution exposes the Islamic Republic regime for what it really is. And they pray that their country will flip from Iran and become one of the leaders in the Christian faith in the world. That is a transformation and a confidence that humbles me. We should pray for them, um, seriously. The underground Christ followers in Iran are considered to be the fastest growing church in the world. The growth is attributed mainly to these women who are individually engaging with other women one-on-one, -on -one, and the women believe that every believer is responsible for discipleship as soon as they know Jesus and believe. They want true disciples, not just converts, the kind of disciples who know the truth the Spirit provides that bubbles up inside of you just as it did with the woman at the well when Jesus met her. She ran back to the city, remember, and told everyone in the village, our true life is in Christ, and we will never need anything else again. Late in this film, there's a woman that tells her own personal story. She had a chance to get out of Iran and live in the West. Now, honestly, I looked for it. I can't remember if it's the United States or Europe somewhere. So we're just going to call it the West for now. A place where she would not be suppressed as a woman and she could openly live her faith. After some time, she chose to go back to Iran. She felt more alive there more spiritually alive, she said. And she spoke about the culture in the West. And she said, you know, it felt, it felt kind of spiritually dead to her. She said, we, they don't know, we don't know the Holy Spirit the way they do. Because they have to. They, you know, we have too much at our own disposal and they have to rely on him. She preferred her life in Iran with the, and accepted all that risk because she desired that palpable presence of the Holy Spirit and that addictive, contagious feeling of his power and protection over a life of safety without him. So that's a powerful testimony too. Women of Iran have discovered the power of connecting with the Holy Spirit and using that power to connect with other women who in turn make disciples in their families, and the results are just explosive over there. It really brings new meaning to the verse in Matthew 16, 
where Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you want to be my followers, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you save it. Verses like this one have given these women peace and confidence to be disciples of Christ. Sheep among wolves, watch it on YouTube <laughs> if you want to. And speaking of confidence, or maybe the lack thereof, <laughs> I'm going to close with a personal story about doubt, something I went through. Um, I have a note, handwritten note on my wall uh, from me, <laughs> to me, that says, why do you wrestle with God when you hear the truth? This is a reminder to myself that sometimes when I have been given an instruction or a nudge, I like to wrestle with the message as if it was not from God. And my term wrestle really means doubt combined with fear, and if I'm pro honest, probably a lack of confidence. <laughs> so recently, this is what happened. Uh, I struggled with a family relationship, and I felt that the Holy Spirit's counsel to me was to remain silent until, unless or until, I got a nudge from him. And I was confident in remaining silent. So that was kind of easy, actually. <laughs> but when I sensed it was this nudge, and it might be time to um, have a difficult conversation with a family member, I doubted. The situation, you know, was kind of delicate. And I had a lot to lose confronting this person. And I was afraid my unsolicited advice, I might add, would cause further damage to my relationship. James 1.5 says, If any of you should lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Now, I pray this verse a lot, <laughs> to be real honest, but I usually stop here, you know, asking for the wisdom. And recent, on this occasion, someone who didn't know what they were doing challenged me to keep reading. Uh, <laughs> so, I did. Next verses. <laughs> but when he asks... He must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like the wave of a sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. I was horrified, <laughs> to be real honest. I was absolutely horrified when I read this. And... You know, how often do I do this and don't even know it? Um, it? You know, when you're not, when I don't do what God has asked and nudged me to do, it's really nothing short of disobedience. And this verse hit me hard, and it scared me more than the tough conversation that I had to have with my family member. So I was determined to remedy this right away, <laughs> which of course started with confession. I wanted God to know I trust him. I trust him with my relationship and my fear. And I also wanted him to trust me. So further validation that it was time for me to speak came that weekend. I told you last weekend, I, the, one of the ways the spirit talks to me is through validation all the time. Validation, validation. And um, Derry, priest, Pastor Derry, preached this great sermon on hard words to speak to someone, when you have to speak hard words. And this is what he taught. Um, it all started when I asked for God's intervention and help concerning this relationship. I received a message. I filtered the message with the consistency of scripture, and I did do that. I found nothing inconsistent. I consulted spiritual guidance from a trusted individual. And ladies, I said this in the prayer, a connection on this level is really important for you. And if you don't have one, then I want you to pray about it, and God will give you one because it works for him. It's, it, you know, glory is brought to him when two or more are gathered in his name. And we're here to help each other. And, there's, and you have all of our emails on your reference sheet. So if you don't have one, you can start there. <laughs> but anyway, I, I prayed then 
for courage and that my words would be received and spo spoken in truth and love and received. And at this point, honestly, I started to get more confident. I was less afraid and I even became excited because God was giving me an opportunity that I prayed for to make a difference and move this relationship forward. So I was excited by that and I obeyed and I spoke. And the results of this conversation were successful, but this is not the takeaway that I want you to have. The takeaway that I want you to have is that if you pick up on this process and you uh, practice this and you consult it, it will give you confidence. Connecting with the Holy Spirit is a confidence builder. So because we ask for help in something, uh, don't doubt what you receive, you know. It's likely from God. Trust his promises. He, he heard you, your request. He gave you an answer. You, you know, you didn't make this up in your head. And especially if you tested it against scripture, you can trust the results. Um, even if the results don't exactly look like what you expected right off, you can still trust it. God's ways are perfect. There is a word of caution, though. Don't put yourself in the position that I did, a position of disobedience. If you don't react to the message you receive, especially if you asked for God's help, it's sin. And sin does not please God. Allow him to give you the best plan he has for you by being obedient. Have you considered that through disobedience, instead of God's best for you, you may actually be furthering the enemy's plans instead. That's what scared me. So I encourage you to move confidently the next time this happens to you. God does not expect perfection. He can redirect us if he needs to, but God expects us to seek him. If you practice these steps, you, uh, you will trust uh, and, and become more confident in the Holy Spirit. We have a God who hears our prayers. And he's always present in the person of the Holy Spirit. You know, he's forever faithful, and he keeps his promises. And he'll be there when you need him. So no need to doubt it. <laughs> All right, ladies. Um, I'm going to give you a few minutes at your table again to have a, a little discussion with your table mates there. Um, just how confident are you in working with the Holy Spirit? And what are... And what are is that a typo? <laughs> um, in what area of your life would you like to see some growth in the Holy Spirit? And we'll be back with Chris soon, but I'll give you like eh, five minutes or so. Okay. Well, welcome, ladies. It's kind of loud. <laughs> Good evening, ladies. Thank you, Jesus. It's not snowing. <laughs> that we could all be here. I'm Chris Halsmer director of Prime Timers, along with my husband, David. Uh, as I was listening to Leanne and something that happened just today, I love when the Lord gives you a fresh word. Today, I talked to my 100-year-old mother-in-law that I love so much. We're 1,200 miles away, and she said that she would be praying for me, but she'd be praying for you, and she's a prayer warrior. The encouragement she gave and just the joy in her voice to hear that our church, our women's group, was doing a talk on the Holy Spirit. Years ago, we used to hear a lot about the Holy Spirit, and then we stopped talking. And I think we lost the power in the church. So thank you, Leanne, for bringing us back to this. Thank you. Also, I have a twin sister. I also talked to her today, 1,200 miles away. Her Bible study at this very moment in Indiana is praying for you. I love the connection. It gives me confidence I'm not standing here alone. I have the Holy Spirit and I love him dearly, but I love my sisters in Christ. I love humans. I love to be able to see each other and I love the connection. And I love, my twin and I are very much alike but my path has had me go in front of a platform. My twin sister is a little shyer, but she's my prayer warrior. So whenever I speak, 
I, know, I feel her prayers. I know she's with me. And, that's, and the results are glorious because of her prayers. I love the name of this conference uh, that Leanne chose, Are You Ready? And since she has told us we've been working on this for a while, everywhere I go I see, Are You Ready? It's like, wow, Lord, what a good word. Just last week, I found one of my journals seven years ago that had this message. I wrote, I sensed the Lord saying to me, don't be afraid to speak, to, uh, don't be afraid to speak out about me. I will do the work in them. You just obey where I send you. You will be amazed what will take, what will be happening. Give me the praise and the glory. For it will be my spirit doing the work and going before you to show the way and tell you the words to give out. Ready? Yes, Lord, I'm ready. So tonight, I'm just giving out food. I'm just giving out seed, what he told me to say to you. It's interesting how I'll close two stories at the very end that kind of surprised me and said, Lord, you're so good. You're just so faithful to give words. They're cute little stories, and I think you'll enjoy them. All these pages here. When I read Leanne's uh, rough draft for tonight, I couldn't be more excited that she was mentioning Mark Batterson's book. Reading the book, Whisper, How to Hear the Voice of God, was a divine assignment for me in the summer of 2018. Tonight I will share connecting with the Holy Spirit through scripture, mainly Jeremiah 21:11. The second part will be about love languages that the Holy Spirit might use to speak to us, stated from the book, Whisper, with, with some personal examples. I love stories. My first Bible was given to me by a college roommate, Easter 1974. It was called The Way, The Living Bible. Revival was certainly taking place on college campuses throughout our nation in the early 70s when I was there. I knew and loved the Lord since I was little, but the only Bible that we had in our home was a big family Bible on the coffee table, not one that I could personally have myself. Reading the Word, I found that my new Bible was really a love letter written to me. With this Bible, I could underline passages and even jot down dates when a verse stood out. And so, I don't know if you can see this. I, the first time I wrote in a Bible, I thought, oh gosh, I don't, I don't know if you should do this. But I, I was a teacher and I had markers and I love color coded. And so I went crazy on this. And so it's kind of a mess. But you know what? It helped me not be a mess. And so I devoured this book. And Jeremiah 29, 11 began to be one of those scriptures, just jumping up off the page. So I wrote in my Bible, October 84, then 86, then 1989, and then in 1996, my son received a graduation card. Never underestimate the power of a card. My son received this graduating card with this verse. Ever since then, 25 years, I've had this on my desk. It seems like yesterday I put it on my desk, but it's been 25 years. I have prayed this prayer, Jeremiah 29, 11, at least a thousand times. Some with joy, some with tears. I especially love the first part of it, that our Heavenly Father, God of creation, made us, and He has plans for you and me. I began keeping a journal every year after all those years of post-it notes and scraps of paper that were stuck in my Bible or all over my desk, and I finally got organized and I started having a yearly journal. Then I began asking the Lord for a yearly verse. Sometimes I sense what the scripture would be in the fall, before the new year. Other years, 
I didn't know for sure that, year, that verse until maybe February or so. It was his, it was his um, uh, direction and I wanted to make sure that was the verse. It's interesting to view that every December, I review that, that verse to see how that verse or verses really anchored me through that year. In Jeremiah, or excuse me, in January 20, uh, 2009, Jeremiah 29, 11 became my yearly verse. The year before, I had experienced much loss. Our daughter lost two babies that year through two pregnancies. Two pets died suddenly, stroke, and then our four-year-old darling little kitty cat that gave me so much comfort, called Snuggles, um, died of leukemia. And then my mother died. And then there were other transitions going on in my life. It, it would seem like I'd catch my breath and all of a sudden another tragedy happened and I just couldn't breathe. My heart was filled with pain and grief and it was hard to pray, praise, and care about anything. It was hard to read my Bible. What do I believe? I wrote in my journal. I kept seeing this little card on my desk and the Holy Spirit knew what I needed to hear. The words, not to harm you, hope and future stood out. On my 56th birthday, while David was um, serving with mercy ships in Africa, school was canceled due to a big snowstorm coming. Being a teacher, I was glad to be home that day, especially with David out of the country. At 6 a.m., while clearing the driveway, I noticed how dark and quiet my world seemed, yet beautiful, while the snow was gently falling, making everything white. Then I heard these words, the, these gentle words from the Lord. That's not what I heard, but <laughs> that would have got my attention too. <laughs> but I heard, happy birthday, Chris. I knew whose voice it was in the darkness, so I answered, Lord, you know it's my birthday? And he reminded me that he created me and he had a plan. Something broke inside me. I knew my Heavenly Father saw me standing there in the darkness and he knew my pain. And healing began that day. Psalm 147 says, He heals the broken in heart and binds up their wounds. Jeremiah 31, I will turn their mourning into joy and I will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. Are just a few of the scriptures that I clung to and believed for that year. That January day, I knew that Jeremiah 29, 11 would not only be my yearly verse, it would be my life verse. The second part of my talk, the love languages of the spirit. May 2018, I had just retired for the final time. I think I took four times to retire. I love teaching. I just dearly love the teaching. So I finally did just beg me, please, we release it, and the Lord helped me. So I released my teaching career, and David and I sensed for a few years, probably about seven years, that change was coming, but we didn't know uh, in our lives, and doors were closing, what new door would, uh, would open, and where? So the next week, we packed up our camper, headed to Colorado for six weeks, seeking and praying, if this was the time and the place for the next adventure. We've been trying to come for, to Colorado for over 30 years, and the Lord always said no. And then the desire just, I always put it on the altar, and, and I didn't have the desire. Our daughter then moved uh, when she was a new bride, came to Colorado, and that's how I, she lived, uh, she lived in an apartment right down the road, and I started coming for 17 years to Timberline whenever I flew in and loved, loved you people. We didn't know a plan for the next adventure. The first week in town, we attended Timberline Church. When we walked into the cafe, I immediately noticed the book, Whisper, 
on a future, uh, featured uh, display. It was right there out in the open. The word whisper. I love that word. I thought of the times each year that I would get a cold and I'd lose my voice while teaching. My students were extra good on those days and I, because I could only whisper. And so they would start whispering and we would just draw closer and closer. And, and I, I have precious m memories of whenever. I didn't look to get a cold and lose my voice, but they were precious memories being with my students. So checking out the chapter titles of Whisper, this book looked like it would speak truth. It was not going to be sugar-coated message, and I was so ready for that. There was even a chapter on pain and how the Holy Spirit could use that for us to hear his tender voice and to know his care. So I bought the book. The next two weeks, I've never read a book so fast in my whole entire life. But this book I could not put down. In fact, Dave kept saying, what, what are you reading? Oh my gosh, I, I've got to read this book. And, but I not only read it to say, yep, yep, I got that done. I prayed it. I prayed it. I prayed through this book and I found much validation. I just kept saying, yes, Mark, yes, yes, I believe this. Yes, I've experienced this. And yet then knowing that the Holy Spirit had more to say than what I knew. I wrote in the, an interesting remark in my journal, being truly honest with myself and the Lord. And this is what I wrote that day, one of the days that I was, re I was reading and praying through this book. Not sure if Colorado will be or should be our next home. Where do David and I belong, Lord? Go back to Monticello, Indiana, my childhood home, which I dearly loved, was up for sale. Morris Lake to be near Northview Church where we were piloting a senior program or Colorado. Will Timberline give us friends? I so desperately wanted friends. I was retiring and I wanted to have friends. We will return this morning for the church service. Enjoy the journey, Chris. You have said, Lord, many, many times, enjoy the journey. I'm like a little child going on a journey, asking my parents, where are we going and when will we get there? And that's what my life is like, exciting but very scary. Since I can't hear your answers, Lord, I can't see your face filled with excitement like my parents. I'm just called to trust with a capital T. The journey has been longer than I ever dreamt it would be. Two years since asking to release my darling home of 23 years. When will joy overtake me, Father? That very, <laughs> it seems like yesterday, that very morning, Timberline had food trucks after the services. We went and sat at a table out on the lawn by ourselves. Sharon and Ron Anderson, I didn't know them, but they came and asked to sit with us. And then Jerry and Virginia Pippin, directors of Prime Timers, I didn't know them either, came along. Then Mackenzie Matthews, a staff person, sat down too. I thought, wow. Each of us shared about our lives and especially our decision that David and I were trying to make. They would be praying for us. I remarked to David after they left, what's the Lord doing? And who are these people? <laughs> well, we know Virginia, so that is an easy answer. <laughs> the Holy Spirit turned that morning into a divine appointment. 20 days later, we knew where he was taking us. It was going to be Windsor, Colorado, seven minutes from our daughter, who had been here for 17 years and I'd always desire to be together again. We knew when we would be arriving, mid-August. Doors closed, open doors. My Mary Inglebright desk, desk calendar one day had a statement. Nothing happens and nothing happens and then everything happens. <laughs> I know they were talking about spring, but it also seems to happen when we pray. I just found this yesterday. And one of the things on uh, the book with, uh, about desires, 
Psalm 37 for take, de uh, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that's his truth. I wrote down, no wonder the enemy wants me to long for the past and not to desire to go the Lord's way. To questions, every, everything even, do you know what I like? Do you know the way? Do you think I'd like this journey? Why are you taking me this way? Why couldn't I just stay back at home where I was happy? Didn't I really, did I really hear you directing me on this path? Why don't I like this path so far? Those are lies from the enemy trying to discourage me. So I wrote, oh Lord, Sometimes you have to talk to your soul and say, oh, you know, why are you so, you know, dissatisfied? Why are you so upset? So I wrote, I so desire, Lord Jesus, to place my hand and heart in yours. I'm declaring not only to myself, but to, to the enemy of my soul and to the Lord. Delighting myself to just be in your presence, walking along this new path with you, trusting you have the plan, del delighting, seeing what you want me to see, delighting to partner with you into your kingdom here on earth, desiring to be all in for you and with you. And when you declare the word, the lies stop. Then there's a section uh, in the book on pain, but I've already pretty much spoke about that. One thing that he has said over and over that I keep referring back to the day that he said this to me, the Lord, enjoy the journey, Chris. I kept saying, Father, I'm trying, I'm trying. I've got to have your help. Give each joy, each moment, each disappointment, each pain to me. Nothing will be lost. I am the eternal God who loves you. I know where I'm taking leading you to. Hold on to me. Cling to me. You won't be disappointed. Our women's conference this year is called Are You Ready to Listen? Are You Ready to Connect? Next week it'll be Are You Ready to Serve? I have two stories to end. January 4th, 2016, I wrote, Last night, watching Peyton Manning return as number one quarterback for the D Denver Broncos, his interview was stunning. Be ready. He said, I was prepared if needed. He didn't know if he would ever be needed ever again with the Broncos. He had been benched after throwing four interceptions in week 10. At halftime at this new game in, in January, at halftime, things were not going well with the team. So the coach called Peyton into the game for the first time since he'd been benched. Now he was needed. Peyton had been, been, been preparing during this, time, during this time of waiting and was ready. He was suited up before the game. One headline said, Peyton Manning takes over and the internet explodes. The Denver Broncos went on to win the Super Bowl the next month with Peyton as the number one quarterback. I wrote in my journal, what a wonderful role model. Be prepared, be suited up, be ready if and when called on. I didn't feel like getting up early today, Lord, but I want to be so ready when you call. I want to be like Peyton, prepared, study the word, suited up, full armor of God, ready at a moment to jump in not if, but where and when I'm needed. Whisper how to hear the voice of God. The Holy Spirit can and will use anything and anybody. Several years ago, when I went up to my prayer room, my prayer room was, used to have been the saddest room of my house. It was my daughter's bedroom. Whenever I'd go past that, it was upstairs. It made me sad. So two years after she was married, I decided to change to the decorations. And on the telephone, 1,200 miles away, her and I are deciding how we're going to decorate her former bedroom. It became my prayer room. It became my, my safe haven. It was the prettiest room of my house. And it's the one that I ran to. So it's, um, and it was just neat to have a prayer room that just 
brought me sadness when Bethany left, but brought me such incredible joy the rest of the years that I was at that house. So when I went up to the, my prayer room, my little black kitty, I still have him, called Midnight, started to cry. Maybe he thought I was downstairs in our bedroom. He couldn't see me, so I whispered from the top of the stairs his name. David was still sleeping. He, Midnight, heard me the first time, and he cried louder. With hope now, though, he charged up the, the stairs in a mighty run. He made me smile. How I want to come that eagerly when I hear you call my name, Lord. How I like, I am like midnight's cry when I don't know where you are or I can't feel you. But when I hear your voice, everything changes. <laughs> uh, okay, under normal circumstances, we would have these mics ready to roll, <laughs> and because we had two of them originally, and um, so while they change mics, I'll just step in here and kind of tell you, um, we do not have as full of agenda tonight as we did last week, but we are going to just keep it rolling so we can all kind of get out of here just a little bit earlier, so um, if you do need to get up and, and move around, do that. And Rolla is over here getting her mic on. I might tell you, this woman um, was at, married off her daughter last week, her only daughter. So that's why she couldn't be with us last week. But she's here tonight, and she's an outstanding leader in the Bible study areas for us. Um, I, know, I, read, I know some of you out there have been in her classes. You want to raise your hand if you have been in one of Rolla's classes? Okay, yeah, there are a few out there. And... Um, a story Rolla told me was um, that what brought her back into teaching was she was tired of our enemy attacking her friends. And so she decided she needed to get in and um, start to, to teach a little bit more on the Holy Spirit. So yeah. Rolla Moore, she can take it. We have never had quite a night like this. There we go. Okay. Yeah. There I can hear myself. Okay, I'm going to pull out the whiteboard, so just bear with me while I kind of switch things around here. My name is Rolla. My name does not mean anything. That's usually the question every person asks me right off the bat. Um, I wish it you know, had some like special meaning, but it really doesn't. And um, I do tell people that it um, was the only part of my, the 60s my mom experienced was to name her child something strange. But it, it fits me pretty well, so it works. Um, I've never really regretted it except when Rolos came out. Do you remember that, Canny? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so if you can't remember it, this is a little trick I give people to help me remember my name. So you can sing it with me. Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Ra la 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 la, la 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 la. There you go. All right, now you got my name down. Um, we do have one daughter. She got married this weekend, and I don't think I ever had more fun ever in my life through the whole process. It was just amazing. Um, she married a man that has an amazing testimony and. Um, I'm sure they're going to be doing some mighty work for the Lord because they encourage me and inspire me and terrify me all at the same time. So um, if you've been in my classes before, I see a few familiar faces and I'm glad you're here. You're giving me courage. Um, I don't normally talk with a mic, even though my mom says I should all the time because I speak so quietly. Um, I think the first thing we're going to do is, um, I'm just going to pray because I'm a little bit nervous. Um, Heavenly Father, I just need you to calm my nerves and to um, help me to speak clearly. Help me not to speak super fast. And um, may the words that I speak be heard by each woman in here the way you need them to hear. Um, Everybody's story is so unique and beautiful and different. 
but you know them personally. And uh, so speak to them just like you spoke to Chris in her prayer room. You are mighty and we love you so much and we need you so desperately. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I have the handout um, that is kind of like the drawing one. Um, I think it's going to come up. Maybe it's going to come up. Anyways, okay. We'll, we'll just leave that up. So that's where the handout is it's going to be. But the first verses I want you to look up are Jeremiah 2.13. Ah, that's the handout. Okay, that's me. Okay. So I'm not going to have you go through every verse on there just because we'd be here too long. And um, But I do want to start by looking up at the verse at Jeremiah 2.13. Um, and if you know me very well, my life verse is you may make your plans, but the Lord directs your footsteps. So how do you like that? That's a life of surprise all the time, isn't it? Okay, Jeremiah 2, 13. For my people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that cannot hold water. Okay, what I would like for you to do is really just put in your thought bucket the fountain of living water. Okay, we're just going to drop that in our thought bucket, the fountain of living water. Okay, now let's turn a couple pages over. We're going to go to Jeremiah 17. I have a mark, so I'm, I'm ahead of you. Okay, are we there? I don't want you to, I want you to all be there. Jeremiah 17, 13 through 14. And I'm reading out of the Holman version, so it may read just a little bit different. Lord, the hope of Israel, all who abandon you will be put to shame. All who turn away from me will be written in the dirt. For they have abandoned the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved, for you are my praise. Again, in your thought bucket, put the fountain of living water. All right, now let's skip on over here to John 4. Don't you love it when God gives a confirmation? So when Leanne just uh, mentioned the Samaritan woman, I just see, ooh, I love a confirmation. Um, so this is when uh, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and you know what I love the most about Jesus? That he loves women so much. I mean, do you know that, I mean, he spoke privately to this woman, and that was something that was very undone in the culture, and it was also a woman that got to see him first when he had risen again, and so if you ever think that you are not loved, you just go through the scriptures and you see how many times he chose a woman over a man. <laughs> I don't know why, but that just really gives me a little bit of joy right there. Sorry, we have one man, one man in the house. Um, okay, John 4, 7. Um, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink for me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus had answered, if you knew the gift of God who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. So again, we're going to put that living water right into our thought bucket. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are, you aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as his sons and livestock. Jesus said, Everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again, ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well, a water of springing up within him for eternal life. All right, let's just turn a couple pages over. We're going to go to John 37, verses 30, uh, John 7, I'm sorry, verses 37 through 39. All right, are we about there? OK. 
Okay. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, will have streams of living water flow from the deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been received, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So, um, we've all been sitting a while, so I want you to do something with me, so stand up. Okay, so... um, now, don't be afraid to act a little silly. All right, so act like you have a pencil here in your belly button. All right? Okay? And we're going to spell a word. All right? We're going to spell the word streams. Okay? So, all right. So, if this was writing on the wall and you had to hold it in your belly button and you were going to write it <laughs> on the wall. Okay? So, so, don't be shy. Let me see you. Okay, so I want to see the S. Right? Okay, now the T. Okay, don't forget to cross it. Okay, R. Come on. Oh, some of you have a really flat R. Okay, how about an E? (laughs) Some of you are pretty good. I think you could do some dancing. A. (laughs) Okay, and... Cross your A. Now M. Okay. Boy. All right. All right. And since we want it to be plural, because we don't want to have one stream, we need one more S. All right. Come on, ladies. Let me see your S. All right. So we have streams of living water flowing flowing through us. All right. Are you woke up? Yeah. All right. You can sit down now. Um, if you have a piece of plain paper, I'd actually prefer you use a piece of plain paper than use my cheat sheet I gave you, um, just because I really want you to know this and I want you to be able to do it again. And uh, um, so I love a whiteboard. And so how many of you actually have a piece of paper? Okay, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to erase something on the whiteboard that you're not going to be able to erase and you're going to go... <clears throat> I can't erase, so maybe divide your paper in, in half so that you don't feel frustrated. Okay, so I'm basically going to take what Chris was talking about and Leanne was going to talk about, and I'm going to put it in a chart. So um, the ladies that have been in my class, you guys know this really well. So when we looked at First Thessalonians, this is the verse right up here. Um, It says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we take it from this scripture and from the one in Hebrews where it says, um, for the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating as far as the soul and the spirit. So this is where these, uh, they get these teachings that we are actually a three-part being, um, which is like the Trinity. So that's actually very cool. So I'm just going to show you this thing. So get ready to draw your circle. Okay, so we're going to make a small circle. Okay like that. And then in here where I'm going to put that we're actually dead. And you guys talked about this a little bit um, last week, that we were born spiritually dead. And um, let's see where we are. My scripture's here. When we are, um, Romans 5 is the chapter that really um, gives a good, and I put a lot of different references here, and like I said, we're not going to go through all of it because we would just be here a really long time, but we are born dead. We know that when we were born in Adam, that we, uh, when sin came and entered the world, that we were born spiritually dead, So, but we also know that through Christ, we are born alive and we can be born again. And so it's really important. I really feel like one of the things that has happened in the church is that people don't fully realize what it means to be born again. And um, I 
think that really saddens me, and I think that's partially the reason we're not seeing a lot of growth, um, is because you are born again. You were in the domain of darkness, and when you believed Jesus, you were transferred to the domain of Christ. And so we are actually in Christ. So Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. So communion is really, if when you start thinking about it like that, I mean, he's, he's in us, you know, it's like we ate him, you know, he's, he's in us, you know, it's not like he's just my friend and he's right here, he's, he's, he's in me, he's, he's in me, he's in my heart, he's in my mind, he's in my soul, he's in me, and that is what has given us spiritual life, which is what you guys talked about in Ephesians 2. So, right here in this first circle, when we are born again, I'm going to use red because we're using all this red today. Spirit life, okay? And we are alive. There's all different ways this is taught. Um, so you can write it, whichever makes the sense to you. But one thing I want you to do is I want you to do something with me. So get your hands up. Okay, when we are born, we are like, a, we're like this one hand right here, but we're, we're dead, okay? But when we ask Christ into our hearts, it's like he comes and he intertwines with our spirit and he makes us alive. So this is how we are. We are intertwined with him. So he can't, he can't, we, we can't get away. We cannot get away. And he is intertwined with us. And so this is when our spirit becomes alive and we are intertwined, our spirit, with his spirit. Okay, the second circle that you're going to draw is the one that's around. And I practiced this, so hopefully you guys can see it in the back. Um, so this is your soul, soul okay? So remember, we're a three-part three part being. We are a spirit, a soul, and our body. And they get that from um, the Thessalonians verse in Hebrews. So sometimes it's confusing, like, what is our soul? Okay, so our soul is actually our mind, our will, and our emotions. Okay, and I put this on your chart so you can look at that. And then the definitions that are like around that page, I pulled off of Bible Hub. And so they're the, like the Greek um, definitions for that. So that's if you want that source. So this is what our soul is, is our mind, will, and our emotions. So this is where we get hung up. So until we're born again, we have functioned throughout our entire life making all our decisions based on our own thoughts, our own feelings, and our own choices. Um, I'll stand on this side so you guys can see this. So sometimes this is called carnal, sometimes it's called soulish life. Um, they use different translations with it in the scriptures and so it kind of makes it a little bit confusing. Um, but what we want to start doing, we want to start surrendering all of these to the Spirit. And we want to start living by the power of the Spirit. But what's hard is we've had all of these patterns, we've had all these habits, all of these years of doing these things. And so when we have this reaction or we have this pattern, it's kind of like we have to re relearn it. And um, so another scripture that uh, when we read John um, 7.37, they call this the innermost, which um, is a really beautiful translation. That's the New American Standard and the Amplified. So they call this the innermost being. And so this is the part that goes to heaven. Okay, so your spirit and your soul go to heaven, and then our body, you know, we get a new body, wahoo, you know, we'll be all healthy and no arthritis and none of that. Thank you. I was wanting to make sure I was halfway. I have all these question marks by different things I may, may mention or may not. So, um, then the third part of our being is our body. 
okay. So we are body, soul, and spirit, okay? And our soul is our mind and our emotions and our will. And then you're like, well, what's your heart, okay? So the definition of heart is at the bottom of your little handout here. So basically, your heart is this combined. Okay, can you see that? So it's not drawn super well, but the heart is what is when our spirit and our soul are all together. Okay, so, you know, there's tons of scriptures that come up when we think about the heart, you know, guard your heart and all of these different things. So this is what he's talking about. Okay, so when I was listening to Chris's story, um, I was like, oh, she has just shared this, so I'm going to use you as an example, Chris, <laughs> since you just shared that. And so I'm going to give you some three steps that... Um, help us to kind of get the rubber to the road, if you know what I'm saying, okay? So if we're going to flow living water out of here, I brought a blue marker up just for my flowing of living water, okay? So we want to flow living water. That's what we want to do, okay? So if we're flowing living water, and this has happened to come flowing out of our emotions, it's happened to come out of our choices, and it's happened to come out of our mind and our thoughts. Okay, the hard thing is though, is like Leanne said about me, is the reason I started teaching again was I was just sick and tired of the devil beating up on my sisters. And I'm just telling you straight up, I'm just mad about it. I'm just pretty darn mad about it, and so I'm uncomfortable, and I'm always scared, but I'm mad enough that it doesn't seem to matter because I just hate the fact that that beaten enemy is hurting, hurting my family and hurting the body of Christ. And one of the ways I see that he is hurting us is that we may have an emotional wound, okay? So Chris was talking about all the tragedies that happened in that short amount of time. Okay, so these are big emotional wounds. But she was getting her thinking under control. She said that she doubted, she was challenged, she, you know, her faith was challenged. And then she made the choice to go ahead and seek the Lord, seek the Lord. She had a prayer room, she sought the Lord, she sought the Lord. And that was how she healed. And that is how that living water began to flow through her. Okay, now I'm going to tell you, um, this is a little bit about me. Um, I wasn't quite sure which story I was going to tell you, um, but since we were talking about my daughter, um, I have one daughter, okay, my husband and I do, and she is a result of one prayer. So never underestimate the power of one prayer. My dad had had cancer off and on. You know how cancer can kind of come and then remission and come, you know. And um, so we've been married a little over a year, and I said one prayer. And I said, Lord, if, the, if my dad isn't going to live another five years, maybe I should have a child. Lo and behold, I was pregnant the next month, okay? And um, my dad passed away when she was a little over a year old. But because I had put that if in there, I never uttered a word of that because, you know, I was scared. Um, but it also really built my faith because I was like, wow, one prayer, you know. And, uh, but what made the miracle even more amazing is that I can't have children. You name it, it's wrong with me. You know, I mean, I've got also, I've went through everything, you know. Um, everything we could possibly financially afford, um, I, I tried to do, and so I could not have children, and so that even made her a greater, a greater miracle to me. But I will tell you, I was mad at the Lord. I was mad at Him, and I had a hard time having any flow 
because I was just so mad at him. It wasn't like I lacked faith. I was just mad. I was just mad at him. He wasn't doing what I was wanting him to do. I mean, that, I mean, bottom line, I was wanting him to give me another kid. What, he gave me one? He's God. He'd give me another, right? You know, so it wasn't like I was lacking faith. But in a way, I was lacking respect. And so this was quite a few years ago. Um, and my husband traveled a lot, and I was in bed. And I never purposely read Job. I don't know what you guys think of the book of Job. But I never purposely read Job. So somehow I had been cross represent I end in the end of Job. And if you guys are familiar with the end of Job, it says God is God, right? And you know how sometimes you can pick up a scripture and it just mm, hits you right in the stomach? Hit me right in the stomach. Hit me right in the stomach. And it was basically like, I, I've said no. And that's the end of it. But I still had some emotions. But at least I was making a better choice. And I was taking my thoughts captive. And then I could deal with the emotions later. Okay, so then this is on a lighter note. So um, the step number one, and I want you to write this down, if you have a wound, and I call this a soul wound, okay? Anytime, you know, sticks and stones may break your bones, but the words shall never hurt me. That's just a big fat lie, okay? Words hurt, okay? So let's just say you've been hurt, like rejection. Rejection is one of them. Okay, and rejection can come in giant sizes and small sizes. So the very first step, and I want you to write this down, is I want you to tell that I want you to tell Jesus, the Holy Spirit, Father God, whichever one you're more comfortable with, that it hurt. Very first step is to say it hurt, because what we tend to do is act like it didn't hurt, and even when it's minimal, you know. It still hurts your feelings, you know? You are a soft, tender woman, you know? Your heart is gonna get hurt. So first of all, tell him that it hurt. So um, I had went through this, this series of, it was just a, a rejection is basically what it was. And so I was telling Jesus it hurt. It hurt me. Okay, but I didn't really know what to do with it. And so this is what I do when I'm hurt and I don't know what to do with it. And it came, seems to be like kind of stuck in there. I worship. That's what I do. Sometimes I worship in private. And sometimes I go to whatever church is having a worship night. And I worship. Okay. So I'm sitting there and I am in worship. And it was honestly like it came out. And it was about, and it was, hopefully I don't freak you all out, but this is what it was. So it was about this long, and it was so real, and it was like this dagger, and it was like bloody. And it was in my hand, and I was like, I don't, I don't know what to do with it. It was so real to me, and I was at worship at Res, and I, th I kept thinking, should I go to the trash can? You know, because it was, it seemed yucky, and so um, I... I was praying about it. I'm like, I don't know what to do with it. And then the next thing the Lord said, he says, are you going to waste my wounds? Because by his stripes we are healed. And I was like, no, I'm not. And so I let it go. I let it go. And so the second step that I want you to do is you just need to tell him it hurt and you need to let it go, and then you need to receive comfort from the Holy Spirit. So the second step is to let it go, and the third step is to receive comfort. So even if it's the smallest thing, if you have a wound right here, and you remember it, it could be something your mom said when you were seven years old. And it comes back to you every once in a while. I want you to do those three steps. You tell the Lord it hurt me, it hurt my feelings. The second step 
is I give it to you. And the third step is I actively receive your comfort because I am not going to waste your wounds. By his stripes we are healed. And we're not going to waste his wounds. And then we are going to flow a lot more pure and just natural water that won't be tainted. So I just want to close with this. In Jeremiah 17, 14, that we began with, he says, Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed, and save me, and I will be saved, for you are our praise. And it's amazing what happens for the healing when you are praising at the same time. So if you have a wound tonight when you go home, you give it to him, and you leave it. And you ask him to come in and comfort you. Because ladies, we, are to, we, we need to be powerhouses for the Lord. And we can't be walking around flowing tainted water because we haven't accepted healing. So don't try to be strong anymore. You just give it to him. He is our strength. Thank you. Good evening. Last week, we're here. We used breathing in and out, palms up, palms down. So tonight, if you're able, stand up. We're going to be tree branches. If you're not able to stand up, don't want to get up, you can be bush branches. <laughs> so stretch out your arms like branches. Bend with the wind. Reach for the sun. Wave at your friends. Now imagine fruit coming onto those branches. Your limbs are getting heavier. Their limbs are coming down. They're going farther and farther with that good, fat, juicy fruit. Okay, you can rest your trunks in your seats. I am Janice Schleker, and I'm a staff member here at Timberline Church, and I'm delighted to share with you again tonight. I hope that you had a good week practicing listening to the Holy Spirit and hearing what the Lord had to say to you. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, and is in spoken in such connection with God and Christ that it shows they are of the same divine nature. And that was a quote from my, one of my favorite professors um, who was about this tall. I was actually taller than him. <laughs> That divine nature is what fills us and uses us for kingdom purposes. It's that living water that Rala just spoke about flowing in and out of us. As we look at connections in the Holy Spirit, one connection is the gift of the Spirit, which next week you're going to receive a handout from me to look at later. Another of connections is the fruit of the Spirit. This is a drawing by my sweet, sweet sister, Dawn Davidson, who lives in Florida now. She's a terrific artist who shares her talents with you tonight. She did this just for you. And she just happened to already have a tree that was in her file that, and added the words and the scriptures to it for me. She's a great woman who loves the Lord and more than anything else in life. She's a CSU grad, so she was here for a while. And she's married to Matt, and they have three very rambunctious kids who have artistic talent beyond belief. She loves to climb trees, so imagine her just having a tree in her file. I think you would enjoy my friend Dawn, so enjoy her um, work tonight. Without the fruit of the Spirit, the special gifts are just like a clanging cymbal that makes noise but has no value. We want and desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but we need to live out the fruit for those gifts to be most effective. John Michael Talbot, in his book, The Jesus Prayer, says, the way back to the primacy of the Spirit is through dying to our old selves, as Rala just talked about. The fruit of the Spirit in his Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if you want to know how to remember that, there is a cute little kid's song that has all those words in it. Paul informs us how our lives are made fruitful. 
Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit. Who does not want to live like this? How different our world would be if we lived out the fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. It, has, it means fruit of life or breath. There's that word breath again that we talked about last week. These are attributes that we are called out to live. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in, my, in Christ's names, will teach you all things. The fruit is learned from our teacher, the Holy Spirit. The verses just prior to Galatians 5.22 talk about everything that can destroy life and the things that keep us from inheriting the kingdom of God. Then Paul gives us this fruit, that precious juicy, soul-satisfying, life-giving fruit. Fruit qualities or characteristics that can't be earned. It's a free gift from the Spirit. Fruit is a product of a healthy tree or plant. How many of you are gardeners or like flowers? I'm a farm girl from way back in Nebraska. So I know about sick plants. A sick, weak, dying plant does not bear much fruit. Or the fruit in it might simply be misshaped, not as healthy. Sometimes it's even rotten by the time you pick it. The fruit of the Spirit is a product of the Spirit living within you, breathing and producing life. That Christ-like character that we all want to exemplify. John 15, 5, one of my favorite verses says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Okay, wave those branches again. See, your branches. The one who abides in me and I in them bears much fruit. From apart from me, apart from God the Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, we can do nothing. I like how James Brian Smith put it in his book. He talks about the Spirit has chosen to cultivate the gospel soil of people's lives so that they bear spiritual fruit. Colossians 1.10 says to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit in every good work. It is not something we can do or produce on our own. We need to be in tune with the Spirit, listening to the Spirit, as we learned last week, watching for the Spirit in our daily life. And I could spend an hour on each one of these words. Not going to do that. There's a handout in your packet. And I'm, that's got lots of scriptures. You can take it home and study through each one on your own. So quickly, what do they mean? How do they impact each of the, our lives and how to live them out? I'm going to give you the Greek word. It's one of my fun things to do. A brief definition and a little bit of application for each one. The Amplified Bible is a good Bible to do when you're doing this kind of a word study. You can meditate on each one of those words and see those multiple words for each fruit. Notice it says fruit, not fruits. The nine fruit listed are a unit. They're connected, interrelated, dependent upon one another. And I believe that the order of the fruit was not coincidental. There's a purpose for that. The first one is love, agape. You're all pretty familiar with that one, unconditional love. God is love, so it's not surprising that love is the first one mentioned. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the greater or the greatest of faith, hope, and love is love. God defined love for us. It involves the will, not just our emotions. It is not selfish, but selfless. It can be commanded. The will is the dominant factor, and emotion is the trailing factor. Oh, I'm so in love. That's the emotion talking. But love can be made without that emotional factor. In the Eastern or Asian culture, which the Word of God was mostly written in, um, the culture comes, obedience comes first, then the emotion. If we have love, we will obey all of Jesus' commands. <laughs> See? If we are not loving, we do not resemble Christ, and the Holy Spirit will convict us of our unloving ways, enable us to love others with Christ's love. 1 John 4 is a great chapter to spend learning about love. The next one is joy. Kara. Joy, the root Greek word there is related to charis, which is grace. Joy and grace. What a beautiful combination. 
Joy means gladness, happiness, not as the world defines happiness, but an inner joy that only comes from God in his spirit. Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy is often determined by what is going around us. Even in the midst of a crisis, you can, joy can be produced. Philippians 4, 4 says, rejoice always. That is a command. The enemy of joy is anxiety. John 16, 22 says, no one or thing can take your joy away from you. The Holy Spirit gives us that joy. My great-great-grandmother's name was Joy. I didn't know her. I don't know if she was always joyful. She had a very hard life. But I do know that all her daughters, granddaughters, great-granddaughter, great-great-granddaughters, and now her great-great-great-granddaughters knew or know the Lord. I think that's bringing her much joy. So what brings you joy? The Spirit welling up within you? When the Spirit leads you to a scripture, answers a prayer, has a friend who encourages you, a time of quiet meditation, having that bedrock of joy within us gives us the strength to face the injustices of our world. Joy is a deep, living fountain that flows continuously even when we are not aware of it. I've recently been kind of focusing on joy and saying, okay, what makes me joyful? Um, I, last week, I took in a webinar that was on joyfulness is the strength. And that came from Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is my strength. We have that strength. We have that joy within us. Peace, irene. Peace is harmony. It's used in greetings. It's very much like shalom was in the Hebrew. Uh, absence of alienation or strife. God's spirit brings us into perfect harmony with God. The spirit brings order into our lives. There's an element of rest in peace. Psalm 23 says, I shall not want. Uh, Dallas Willard has a book out, Life Without Lack. It's all about Psalm 23 and living that life of peace without lacking anything. In the Beatitudes, we're called to be peacemakers. We find peace when we sow those seeds of peace. Fruit produces more fruit by planting seeds. Peace, peace does not mean an absence of all difficulties or problems, but security in the midst of them. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace, being in tune with the spirit. Philippians 4, 7, and 9 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all your comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds. As for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Patience. Macrothumia. Say that one fast four times. Macrothumia. Long-suffering, enduring, our relationship to people, forbearing with one another. Love is the first fruit, and it's a key to patience. If we have love, we will be patient with others as well as ourselves. The element of waiting, which we talked about a lot, little bit last week, is part of patience. Long suffering. We don't like that word suffering. God's timing and ours doesn't always match up. We don't like to be in that long suffering. We like to get quickly out of suffering. But honestly, suffering is a part and fact of Christ's calling. Self-control, the last of the fruits, affects our patience as well. It helps us to keep going through it all. Patience is a quality of the wise, Proverbs 14, 29. As Leanne said earlier, connection to confidence takes patience. The next one, kindness, Christos tastes. Kindness is mercy, what is right, useful, mild, pleasant, sweetness and loving character. Active benevolence, reaching out to someone. A sincere care and concern for others. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as Christ has forgiven you. Christ is a very pragmatic reflection of Christ's love for human race. 
integrity, righteousness, and truth with Christ's compassion for all. If there ever was a time where this word needs to be put into practice, it's our world today. If we would all be kind to one another, our world would look much different. Kindness is not dependent upon social status, economics, race, whatever divisive way of looking at others. Kindness tops it all. People can be good, but not kind. Kind, but not good. Or both. Let's choose to be both. Which kindness leads to goodness. Agathosune literally means good together. Um, it means generosity in some translations, morally upright, bringing out the best in ourselves towards others, bringing out the best in others. Colossians 1.10 says, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work. Goodness encourages goodness. Pay it forward. Do something good so that the person will do something good for someone else, not necessarily in return to your goodness. Aristotle said, habit is the key to character. We need to make it a habit to being good, to have character of goodness in our daily lives. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 says, pray to fill every desire for goodness with the work of faith with power. Goodness is linked to faithfulness. Faithfulness, pistis. Literally, this word means faith. This word is used over 200 times in the New Testament, but only twice is it translated faithfulness, here and in Romans 3, where it refers to the faithfulness of God. We have God's Spirit producing His faithfulness in us, so then we can show that to the world around us. Faithfulness is reliable. It's loyalty. It's trustworthy. It's not giving to running away sticking to it through to the end. The Spirit keeps us going through the tough and the good. Faithfulness, like love, is also a gift of the Spirit. The next one is gentleness, proud taste, humility, meekness, power under control. It's Jesus with the children, yet calling down the religious leaders. It's humility. The Spirit's leading, not ours. The Spirit's wisdom, not ours. The Spirit's love for others. In Galatians 6.1, we're called to restore the sinning one in a spirit of gentleness. Everything done in humbleness. Colossians 3.12 and 13 says, Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Sounds like the fruit of the Spirit again. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. These verses put the fruit into practical use. And lastly, the crowning fruit of the Spirit, self-control. How many of you say, we've got self-control down? Self-control, egg kretaya. In most versions, it's, it's translated self-control. It means temperance, continence, chastity in some translations. The idea of keeping ourselves under control, to hold on, to grip, power over oneself, to have control of appetite or situation. Genuine self-control is spirit control, letting the spirit work. Working out what God has worked in to the nurture of the fruit of the spirit. To me, self-control is probably the hardest one to exemplify and to put into practice. It needs our full attention when the Spirit leads us in this area. Self-control allows us, others, to shine. We have to put ourselves out of the way and under control. Without self-control, we aren't fully living in the Spirit. Any other, the other fruit that is mentioned here, without self-control, can be harmful, dangerous, self-seeking. We may feel uneasy at times, at, at unrest, as Leanne has mentioned last week. At times when the Spirit is leading us and molding us and changing us, we have this kind of uh, uneasy feeling going on. We have to be listening, watching, expecting the Spirit to produce fruit in us. We may feel uncertain and cautious when the Spirit starts producing that fruit in us. We don't like change. 
but it's a necessary part for the life of the Spirit and for the Spirit to work through us. Expect some unrest. Expect some emotions. If we live by the Spirit, as it says at the bottom of the tree, let us also walk or follow the Spirit. The fruit, the living, giving, produced by a healthy life in the Spirit, active in God's Word and ways, we don't always exemplify these fruit all at once. Several may be clearly working together. The fruit will be there when you need it. Listening to the Spirit's leading in the daily walk shows us what fruit to share, what fruit to shine, and how much fruit is needed and where. The Spirit is tenacious. He is determined to produce spiritual fruit in your life until you are like Christ. You would have to purposely resist, which we don't want to do, the work of the Spirit for Him not to produce fruit in your life. There's no fruit of the Spirit that doesn't have its ultimate goal in service to community. Here's the connection part. Through these virtues, we carry out the commands of Christ to reach our neighbors with the message of salvation. Without the Spirit's character or fruit in us, we would never build God's kingdom in the midst of a hostile world. And that's from Mark Moore in his book, Core 52. So now, we're going to give you a few minutes here to listen what is the Spirit going to say to you? What pr fruit do you need to listen to? So take a few minutes. Just listen. There's, there's the questions. Um, consider what the Holy Spirit's fruit is. And journal. Write down. Do what you need to do to remember this time together with the Lord. Galatians 5, 22 through 24 in the message it says, But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good. It's crucified. This week, bless others with the fruit of the Spirit. Consciously seek to be vessels serving fruit to others. Share your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that the Holy Spirit has given you. Thank you so much. What is it with me and the mics tonight? <laughs> they like you. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Bonnie. Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> okay, I'm having trouble with the mics tonight, but um, uh, what a night, though, right? Um, thank you so much for what you said about unrest, and that's not always a bad thing, but it's awareness, too. I loved what you said about awareness and... and um, you know, my ch personal way I check is just to check in with those fruit of the spirit sometime and see how I'm doing. Okay, so next week we are going to move into service. Um, service means participation. So we're going to talk about, you know, kind of staying connected with the Holy Spirit and how we can participate in that and serve others. Um, in your folder is a flame for journaling. Now, so this is kind of like, remember my handwritten note to myself where I wrestle with the spirit? This is kind of your takeaway. You take away, you write whatever it is you, you feel like really spoke to you in our time together. Um, all right. And I think that is really all I'm going to say about that. And let's go ahead and just close in prayer. And um, <clears throat> Lord God, we just thank you for being present with us tonight. Um, you're always present, but uh, we just are so thankful that um, for this time together and that we can 
uh, worship you the way we can in our country. Lord, we thank you for the confidence and peace um, that we have heard about. We thank you for gently um, turning us into the people that you want us to be. So, Lord, stay, stay with us as we uh, ponder the connections uh, over the next week that we have and um, bring us back together next week as we take a look at serving. Um, Lord, and, you know, we all need to serve because we all need to, a place to share the stories that you do for us. We need a place to pray for others and we need a place to be prayed for. Um, so, Lord, bless us as we return and go home tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord. You, oh, you, Janice wants to pray. Lord, it is so good to be in your presence. Where everything makes sense, it's wonderful to be home again with you in prayer. When I'm with you, I feel your peace, love, and joy rise in me. When I have not spent enough time with you, I greatly miss that priceless sense of the fullness of your presence. Lord, I come before you and ask you to fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit today. Cleanse me with your living water. Wash away anything in my heart of doubt, fear, or worry. Take away everything in me that is not of you. Enable me to walk in the Spirit and not the flesh and exhibit the fruit of your Spirit. Do a complete work in me so that I can show your pure love to others. Teach me everything I need to know about you. Enable me to exhibit faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You are the spirit of wisdom, grace, holiness, and life. You are the spirit of counsel, might, and knowledge. Spirit of truth, help me to know the truth in all things. Thank you for leading and guiding me. Thank you for being my helper and comforter. Thank you that your spirit within me enables me to walk in your ways and do your commands. Help me to pray powerfully and worship you in a way that is pleasing to you. Thank you that you will raise me up to be with you when my life on earth has ended. Until then, lead me ever closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.